I'm very excited to be at Duke, um, mostly because I'm just excited that I get to work in Bach, where I get to work on things I'm passionate about. Um, the financial disclosures, which I did. Um, I want to start off this talk by just honoring my mentors. Um, if you think about all of us in this room, the people that have invested in us to get us to where we are and where we're going, and people that are still investing us, for all of us, is a large number. And a large part of this talk is about mentorship, and so I just wanted to start off by honoring those people that have invested in me. Um, this talk is going to be about pediatric surgery in Uganda. That's the place where I have the most experience. Um, I think some of the concepts are applicable to other areas and other disciplines, but I am going to be focusing on pediatric surgery. We have a team in Uganda. Um, John Sakabira um, is really the first person on this team. He was the only pediatric surgeon in Uganda for several years. And then at some point, Drew Gaz-Gavis, who's a pediatric surgeon at Yale, they formed a partnership together and started talking about ways they can improve pediatric surgery there and also increase the workforce. So since that time, myself and Gustavo and Monica Langer um, we've joined this team and we've created a fellowship program. And Phyllis Kisa was our first fellow that graduated, and Matthew Kimbo was our second fellow that graduated. And we have four fellows in training, I don't have pictures of two of them here. Um, that's our team. So the things that I'm presenting today, um, it's all part of a team effort, and all of those people have been involved. Uh, the big problem in Uganda and other places in Sub Saharan Africa is there are just not enough pediatric surgeons. So this is um, another group that I'm a part of. It's the College of Surgeons of East, Southern, and Central Africa, which contains uh, the countries that are shown here in red. And all of the green stars are locations where they have a pediatric surgery training program. So you can see that a lot of countries, and they have a map on their website where you can click on these countries, and in real time, you can see how many surgeons in the different specialties they currently have, and they constantly update the map. So you can see that there's many, there's some countries like Burundi that have no pediatric surgeons, and then there's other countries like Rwanda, Zambia that have just one in the whole country, and then lots of countries have hardly any. If you add up the populations of these countries, it's about the same population as what we have in the U.S. But they have only 45 pediatric surgeons for that entire population. <coughs> so you can imagine if in the U.S. we had less than one pediatric surgeon per state, how hard it would be if your kids need surgery for them to get surgery. Just for a comparison, just in the Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill area, we have about 10 pediatric surgeons. So you can imagine. Uh, this is a quote that John Sacavera said once. In addition to lack of pediatric surgeons, it also has limited physical resources like operating rooms and intensive care units. And he says, it takes the enthusiasm of an individual to improvise so that a patient can survive. So in this talk, I want to talk a little bit about how have we seen global pediatric surgery in the past and has that been helpful? How society as a whole has seen Sub-Saharan Africa and there was a of a monumental paper that came out a couple of years ago, the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, what are the key points of what they described as going on? And the potential solutions is training up a workforce, keeping a workforce, and then I want to suggest some ways that we can do global surgery maybe to take us a little farther. So how have we seen global surgery? I think for me, for a long time, I was really interested in global health, and I knew that was something that I wanted to do, but I was also interested in surgery. And the models that I was being presented, I didn't realize like how I could make that work for myself. So I think traditionally, we've kind of thought of surgery as, oh, well, that's something that missionaries do. They go and they live there for a long time, and that's what they do. Or um, if you want to be a professor or something, on your vacation time, you can go and you know, do a few cases or whatever. Um, or if you're really motivated, you can raise several thousand dollars, you can get a whole team of doctors and nurses, you can go with all of this equipment, and you can try to do as many cases as you can, in the two weeks that you're there and help as many kids as you can. And I think these are all positive things. Um, I just think that they're not a sustainable solution to the problem. And they also rely on us, like North Americans and Europeans, doing as many cases as we can. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about is how have we seen such an Africa? And I think if we look at the words that we use to describe these variants of the world, it tells us a lot about how we view them and how we see them. 
So a word which I find myself saying sometimes for a whole country. Um, I actually looked it up because I was wondering, like, how do we call certain countries their whole country? Like, what's the definition of that? So it actually is something that came about during the Cold War. And um, there was a French anthropologist named Alfred, Alfred Savi um, who coined this in a paper that he had written. And basically, if you sided with the US and Europe during the Cold War, you were part of the First World. If you sided with the Soviet Union, you were part of the Second World. And if you didn't have a dog in the fight, you were in the Third World. And somehow, that's transitioned to be associated with your poor and you have no health care and everything else you kind of think of. Um, another word that I hear myself use sometimes is when I go to a developing country. Um, so I want to ask you, which of these two pictures do you think comes from a quote-unquote developing country? Um, this picture actually is near where I used to work in El Paso. Um, there's these areas called the colonias where people in the United States live and they have no running water, no electricity, and they live in houses like this. Um, this picture is from Kampali, Uganda. It's like the middle of the city at night. So I just think we have to kind of think about what's developing and what's developed. Um, another word I hear myself say sometimes is, uh, well, that's, I worked in an underserved area. Um, and I just think about like all the aid that, for instance, like the Gates Foundation has put in, um, or USAID, or other government organizations, and faith-based organizations, all of the money that they've invested, and the people that have volunteered, and the people that have served, I don't really think the problem is that we haven't served. Um, just a thought. Okay, and then the last one is um, low resource country. And I think in some ways this term kind of bothers me the most because I often hear surgeons say to me, well, we can't do that here or we can't do that case um, because we don't have the resources or we're a low resource area. And when you sometimes actually look at the resources that they have, you're like, well, no, actually, you can do that here, you can do whatever. I think it gets into people's minds that they're low resource. Um, but these are just a few countries that I visited. And um, for instance, in Uganda, they have a ton of national parks. And half the world's people <coughs> live um, in parks in that country, um, which is, I think, a phenomenal resource. Um, in Mozambique, there's been a lot of oil and natural gas discovered in that country. Uh, Malawi, it's just hard for me to look at this picture with like the rolling pillows full of tea and tell them you have no resources. Um, again, if you look at where the diamonds of the world come out of, like most of the diamonds come out of Southern Africa. So it's hard to say you're a low resource country. Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit and just talk about um, the Lancet Commission and there's five key points that they presented. And I just want to demonstrate in my experience in Uganda how those five points can play out. The first key point is that five billion people lack access to surgical care. And in this half of the world, the darker countries are the ones that lack the most access. Um, I think, you know, traditionally we have thought of global health a lot in terms of infectious disease. That's really what brought global health to the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, but in 2010, there were 17 million lives that were lost due to certain conditions worldwide. And if you add up the numbers from people that die of infectious disease, it's actually 4 million. Um, so I'm not implying that we should stop working on infectious disease, because I think we've made a lot of progress there and we should keep going. But what I am saying is we need to start also focusing on these surgical conditions. Um, gastrocesis is one of these uh, problems in Uganda um, where there's great disparity. So this was a journal article that we published last year about gastrocesis. And basically, what is gastrocesis? It's a condition where when babies are born, they're born with their intestines outside of their abdomen. And you think, how in the world could this possibly happen? So embryologically, <coughs> all of us, it's a normal part of development that our intestines grow too fast compared to our abdominal cavities. And so at some point, our intestines grow and they come out of our belly button and grow on the outside of us. Like, is that not the wildest thing ever heard? <laughs> um, and then they all come back in and go into the right place. So some babies, they don't come back in and they're born like this. As a pediatric surgeon, 
um, they call us, and basically what we do is we put all of the intestines into a special bag that we call a silo. And then we make sure the babies have special IV access and we give them nutrition until their intestines recover. And then over time, we push all the intestines in and fill the bowl. This is what it looks like when it's done. The overall outcome in the US is excellent. We have like almost 100% survival. But you can guess in Uganda, the outcome is not as good. So one of our fellows, um, this is Anne Wasonga, she's one of our fellows this year, she just got married. Um, she came to me a couple years ago, she was a resident, and said I want to do a project study in gastrostasis. So she hung this up on the wall of the hospital and had everybody call her as soon as the baby was born with gastrostasis. So it was a prospective study at the hospital. She followed all the babies that came in for a year and presented with gastrostasis. Um, basically that year we had 42 babies come in and there was only one survivor. That was it. The reasons why babies died, <clears throat> a lot of them came in in septic shock and died of infection. Um, some of them came in with necrotic intestine and they just couldn't survive. Some of them maybe could have survived but there's so little operating room space that they couldn't get a spot in the operating room and they died because of that. And a lot of babies died because there's a perceived poor prognosis that why should we waste time on this baby when there's other babies that can survive and we can spend our time and our resources on those babies. Um, this is just looking at the maternal characteristics of the mom. I think the interesting thing here is that there were actually 23% of moms who got an ultrasound prenatally. But when you look at the number that were correctly diagnosed, only two of them had a diagnosis that like something was not right, and one of those they correctly diagnosed with gastrostasis. This is really important because in our country, we did pre daily diagnose moms, and we told those moms you have to deliver at a center where there's pediatric surgery available. So what's happening is all these moms, they have no idea they have a baby with gastrostasis, um, and they're just delivering their babies, you know, wherever they are. So some of them, a lot of them were delivered in health facilities, um, but some of them were delivered at home, and some of them were delivered on the roadside. And then they had this baby, and they're like, oh my gosh, the intestines are sticking out. I've never like, heard of anything like this. And so they um, basically try to figure out how they can travel to a lot of the hospital. And you can see that it's very, very far. Like, a lot of them are traveling over 200 kilometers to get to the hospital with the baby with their intestines sticking out. Um, this can take you know, anywhere from a day to two days to longer to get to the hospital. This is just a map of Uganda and it's saying the same thing. Um, the hospital is located here in Kampala and all these red dots are where the babies were born. So all over the country they're trying to get to one location. So we identified a few opportunities to increase survival. One is we can work on improving prenatal diagnosis. Um, but once we have a diagnosis, we have to improve access to pediatric surgery. We have to have more than four pediatric surgeons in the whole country. And we have to have those surgeons in places where they're accessible. Um, if we're going to have all those surgeons, we need to have more ORs that these kids can fit into. And then this is a little bit more complicated, but we need to get the special intravenous nutrition that we have here. We also don't have those little special plastic bags there. That should be, you could think, a relatively easy problem to fix. But the biggest problem is you have to change the culture. You have to get people to believe that maybe these kids can't survive. So why did we do this kind of research? I think, you know, we published this paper. It wasn't anything groundbreaking, like Sweden did not call me after this paper. <laughs> um, but we do this kind of research because I think the team, after we published this paper, they got together and said, you know what? We realize that there are things that we could be doing that we're not doing. Like, we can't save all these babies, but we could probably save some if we start doing some different things. And so since that paper, we've started doing some different things, and we've actually been seeing them survive. Um, okay, the second key point is that 143 million additional procedures are needed each year. One of those procedures that is a very strong interest of mine is anal rectal confirmations. So an anal rectal confirmation is another congenital anomaly. Basically, if you look into a baby's butt, and there is no anus. That is an anal confirmation. And sometimes it's just flat, and sometimes, like you can imagine, right here is where the sphincter complex is, and there should be an anus there. But instead, a little bit anterior, there's like just a tiny pinprick opening. That's an anal confirmation. So you say, hmm, that's weird, how does that happen? Um, basically, when you're developing, your rectum develops in your abdomen, and at some point, should travel down and come out right where the Anal, sphincter, anal muscles are. 
So in some cases, it just doesn't come out. It's in there. In other cases, it comes out, but it comes out in the wrong place. And that can be in the um, perineum. For girls, it can be at the back of the labia, near where the vagina is. And for boys, it can open into their urethra or it can open into the bladder. Okay, so what happens um, in the United States, usually these kids are diagnosed right when they're born. Like somebody notices they don't have an anus, they call us, we give them a colostomy, or we fix it just primarily out of colostomy. But in Uganda, a lot of times people don't notice for a couple days, and then the parents are feeding, oops, sorry, feeding their kids, and their kids are getting more and more extended because they can't poop. They know where to school to go. So then they end up getting a colostomy, which is where you bring the cold into the skin. And the colostomy is a life-saving operation, um, but it obviously hasn't fixed the problem. And you can live your whole life with a colostomy. So if they're lucky enough to be able to access a general surgeon, they get a colostomy, but then there's nobody who knows how to do the definitive repair. So how do we do with this repair? We basically take these babies to the operating room, we put a little bump under their pelvis, their butt is kind of sticking up like this, we use a muscle stimulator and we find the point where the muscles are and we make a mark there. Then we go in and make an incision and we go through the muscles and we find the rectum in here. Um, we then have to separate the rectum from the urethra or from the, from the vagina if it's there and repair those structures. This is just kind of a picture. This is where we find the rectum and we've separated it off the vagina here. And then in the end, we put the uh, rectum, right where the anus should be, right in the middle of the muscle complex. We create a perineal body and we sew up the backside. Um, interestingly enough, the year from now, you can hardly tell. Cosmetically, it's a very, very good operation. Nobody ever sees it, but it's cosmetically very good. <laughs> um, so in my personal practice here, between um, the three of us, we probably see about 10 of these kids a year. So just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem, in Uganda, there's about 700 kids waiting for a definitive surgery for this. And we looked at our database at the time, it was looking at one surgeon and two fellows. Over a three year period, we placed 493 colostomies for various colorectal conditions. So that's a lot of colorectal disease for like one small team to be trying to handle on their own. And again, this is just a map of Uganda um, showing where Mulago Hospital is, all the places kids are trying to come get their things fixed. Um, again, children present late for colostomies. So here, you get a colostomy within 24 hours of life. There, you know, some kids came in right away. There were some kids that didn't come in for a week. There were some kids that didn't come in for a month. And then some kids who had like, those little fistulas, they've been like pooping out those little fistulas and they didn't come in for over a year. So when they come in, they're malnourished and um, all kinds of other things. Um, many patients are waiting for surgery. So here, most kids, by the time they're three to six months old, their surgical problem is fixed. Um, when we reviewed our database, you see a lot of kids are not getting fixed till a year of life, two years of life, five years of life, 15 years of life. Tons of kids are just waiting. And once, um, when I was there, we repaired an anal rectum malformation on a kid who was 17 years old. So at 17 years old, he had his first bowel movement that he ever had in his life. Okay, key point number three. Um, there's 33 million individuals who are at risk of catastrophic health expenditure. And in the Lancet Commission, they really focus on financial health expenditure, but I also want to extend this point to just talk about the social aspect of being a kid who has a congenital anomaly. Because I think in some ways that's more damaging than even poverty. And I put this picture up here. Um, I took a trip to Bolivia a couple years ago with a team that was going there. I saw a kid in clinic who was now like 11 or 12 years old, very handsome, very smart, bright kid. He had had an interactive malformation when he was a baby. And he came to clinic saying, um, when he plays soccer, he's having trouble um, with continence, so he has accidents. And when he's asleep at night, sometimes he has incontinence issues. And so as I'm talking to the person I thought was his mom, Brockman, she mentions, oh, I'm not the mom, I'm the grandma. And then she says, his mom has another family. And I just tell that story because I hear that over and over and over again. The kids who have these anomalies, they're abandoned by their parents. Sometimes the fathers will leave the family, and after we take the colostomy down, the father will welcome the kids back into the family. 
So I think it's it's a huge impact on these kids. Okay, so what happens if you have a philosophy for a long, long time? Basically, in Uganda, um, they don't have the special philosophy guides that we have here. So keeping track of the school that comes out is a really big problem. So a lot of times what families do is they use bed sheets and different kinds of clock strips, and they collect the stool this way. This is just an example of a kid who's older and has literally like scarring on her back from these clock sheets. You can also have other problems with colostomy, like it prolapses. This colostomy is structured off, and they have to have a redo operation because their colostomy is not working. So it's not a, a benign thing. Um, earlier this year, we did some focus group discussions with families to give them a chance to talk about the impact um, that these congenital anomalies have on the family and on the kids. And from that focus group, we developed a pilot survey, which we've just given to 15 families so far. So in the survey, um, 13 of the respondents were mothers and two were fathers. Half of the people in the um, survey said that their spouse had left the family. And 93% of the survey participants said that they had left their job to care for the child. Um, most of the time, they keep their children home from school. Um, they're fearful of stigmatization of the child. And it's also um, the people at school like just don't know how to handle the philosophy or anything. Um, they did mention that other caregivers in the hospital have been a supportive force for them. Um, and they have significant health expenses, um, which I'll talk about here in this next slide. So, where does the catastrophic health expenditure come from? Basically what happens is they end up making multiple trips to the hospital um, to try to access care. When they get to the hospital, they find that there's this huge waiting list of all these people that are not just waiting for anal rectal malformations, but there's like pediatric tumors and like everything else you can think of. So sometimes when they get there, they're told, well, you're going to have to wait a week or two weeks or a month, or they're just told the list is so long, you just need to like go home and come back later. So all this traveling back and forth is creating costs. Then if they decide to stay and they're like living in the hospital for a couple weeks, they now have to buy food at city prices instead of getting food from their farm at home. And then even though the care that they provide in the hospital is free, um, things like radiologic studies and some medicines are not covered, so they need to come up with money for these things. Um, so we're taking people that are already impoverished and they're just furthering the spiral of uh, poverty because of this. One project that we're trying to get started is to develop a full record coordinator. So we were thinking either a nurse or a previous family member could be trained to basically keep track of all the full rectal patients and organize them. Uh, we think this would help in a couple ways. First of all, parents wouldn't be traveling back and forth so much because they can call the whole rectal coordinator on the phone at any time and ask them questions instead of coming into the hospital. Um, the coordinator can also figure out when their surgery is going to be and then just call them the week before and say, okay, now's the time to travel. And just travel once and just stay here for a week to get your surgery done. So that's something we have in the works. Okay, key point number four. Investing in global surgery is affordable. Um, I'm not going to talk about this a lot. There's been studies that have been done showing it's a good investment. But I think one way that we can make it more affordable is to um, make the things that we use affordable to low-income countries. So um, we actually just applied for a fast connections grant and we got it, so we're very excited about that. Um, but we're going to do this low-cost laparoscopic surgery with tele-mentoring. Let me explain a little bit about that. So traditionally, for a surgery, um, in the old days, we make a big incision and we go in and we fix whatever is the problem. Laparoscopic surgery came out in like the 80s, 90s, and basically, we just make a few small, tiny incisions, and then using cameras and instruments, we're able to go in and fix whatever the problem is. And this has a lot of benefits. Um, obviously, cosmetically, it's much better, but there's uh, fewer wound infections because the incisions are smaller. Um, people are able to get back to work earlier and back to school earlier because um, the recovery time is less. And this has really become the standard for most surgeries that we do. It's become the standard of care. But in Uganda, we're not doing this, and the primary reason is finances. So just to buy the camera and the monitors and all this stuff, it's about 
and the equipment is very, very sensitive. So once you buy it, you have to constantly have it maintained, which is a lot of money right there. So where our project is focusing on, um, we're working with Minnie's lab, and um, we're taking the cold scope that she's worked on, and we're using some of the same technology, and we're going to build a laparoscope that's durable and much cheaper, and basically the laparoscope can then be plugged into like a laptop computer or an iPad, and you'd be able to do the surgery like that. But the other cool thing is we're going to have it so that we can, over the internet, um, like if I'm here at Duke and the team in Uganda wants to do a complicated case, they could put me into the case and over the internet communicate during the case in real time about what's going on. Okay, and then the last point from the goal of uh, mission is that surgery is an indispensable part of healthcare. And I think if I haven't convinced you of that by now, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> okay, so we have got to increase the surgical work workforce. Um, we cannot meet this need of volunteerism. If you just do the math, there's 359 million people in the U.S. and Canada. We have about 1,000 pediatric surgeons right now, which is about the right number. There's 800 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa. So even if we took like every pediatric surgeon we had and went over there full time and volunteered, there would not be enough surgeons, right? So clearly, volunteerism is not the answer. So how can we increase the number of surgeons? I think the first thing we have to do is we have to encourage medical students in Uganda and other countries to choose surgery. Um, this is a survey right now that we're doing with the medical students in Uganda. So one of the questions we asked is, which specialty do you think is most needed in Uganda? You can see there's you know different opinions. I think Dr. Highland has had an influence there. <laughs> Everybody needs to surgery as it is, is important. Um, but if you ask them which specialties are most supported by aid, and this was three different questions, which are most supported by NGOs, by foreign governmental aid, and Uganda government, infectious disease, OGYN, pediatrics, which I think is reflective of where a lot of funding goes. Um, if you ask them which specialty has the most job opportunities, um, everybody kind of thought the OGYN was the thing to go to right now. Um, how strongly is your special choice, specialty choice influenced by opportunities in private practice government or NGOs? And as you would suspect, I mean, you go through medical school and residency and everything, you want a job at the end, right? Um, so you're going to go where there's opportunities. Um, this is the question that I find disturbing. Um, I plan to leave Africa for training or to practice. And a lot of people are planning to leave, which is... You know, they can't believe me. Um, given the chance to train or work outside of Africa, I would take it. A lot of people said, if I have a chance, I would take it. It's important for doctors trained in Uganda to stay in Uganda. There's kind of like a mixed thought about that. It's important for doctors trained in Uganda to take the best opportunities, even if that means leaving Africa. So I strongly agree. So I think if we want people to go into surgery and stay in Africa, we need to provide them opportunities. I think that's kind of the bottom line. Um, I was going to say a few more words about our pediatric surgery fellowship and some of the things that we've been doing. So one thing we do is surgical camps. That basically means um, our team kind of goes for a week or two or three, and we try to do as many cases as we can over that time. Mostly because if I come and I do an animal hernia repair with you, there's a good chance if we do 20 of them together, when I leave, you can not only do one, you can teach somebody else how to do one. Um, so this is a camp that we did, and what I want to point out is there's limited operating room space. So we had one operating room, and we were doing three cases in one operating room at the same time. We were trying to make the best of what we have. Um, the other thing we've done is we've gotten our um, fellows to apply for these travel fellowships. So the American College of Surgeons, um, American Pediatric Surgical Association, they have fellowships that international surgeons can apply for, and then they come and attend the conference and make connections and other things. We've also brought our fellows here to Duke and to Yale and other institutions to do rotations. And I think this is really good, especially for intensive care unit training, because they really don't have ICUs there. So we're hoping to be able to bring them here, have some experiences, and then they'll be able to go back to Uganda and start some intensive care for their patients. 
We also have a WhatsApp group. <laughs> so all of us are on this group, and anybody at any time can send out a question that they have, and then the whole group will chime in about what should be done with this patient or ideas we have or whatnot. So we kind of have a constant communication. And as I said before, we have two graduates. We have four fellows in training. I don't have pictures of the other two. Um, and our team has been in the news in Uganda. So this is an article that was published in Uganda where they highlighted the anus operations that we're doing. And this um, was actually a baby that was born with eight limbs. It's kind of a, a like a conjoined twin where one of the twins doesn't survive and then the baby who's surviving has like some extra limbs. Um, and our surgeons there separated all the extra limbs off and actually made it to CNN. It's on the news. Okay, and then lastly, once we train surgeons, we need to keep them from burning out and keep them healthy. And this is another study that we have ongoing about burnout. Um, I just want to show a few results. So we asked them, how many partners are in your practice? And you can see a lot of people, they're the only one. Some people have one other or two others and then more, but a lot of people are by themselves. And then how many months this year did you receive 100% of your pay? on the day that it was due. Lots of people are not being paid on time. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> okay, at the very end of the survey, you just left an open-ended, like, tell us anything you want about what's stressful about your job or, you know, whatever. I just wanted to read some of the things that people said. Biggest issue is patient volume and position numbers. Patients are more than doctors can handle. Poor pay, so doctors have to work multiple jobs. Lack of structured leadership, I am the only surgeon in my district hospital. I'm on call every day. Not having mentors I can freely talk with. No rewards, still pay, a lot of work. I feel that my work improves the life of my patients and the world. My work is never ending and overwhelming. I partially fail at all my responsibilities. I feel trapped since there's no one to join and assist me. Lack of proper tools needed for daily work makes me think that yet another operating day with the same old broken tools. While dealing with extremely critical patients in an austere environment where you don't have skilled personnel, it drives you crazy. At times I regret why I'm suffering this much, but soon recover by saying that if I were not there, then the patient would have died. One year ago, I trained a young colleague to share my clinical duties. Now I feel less strength. Okay, so I just want to end by just encouraging us um, to see things differently. And I think one principle um, that's helpful in that is to think about the difference between facts and truth. So facts are the things that we live with and they're all around us and we don't even like think about them sometimes. So one of the things I put here is gravity. It's just, it is what it is, right? But the truth is that this thing exists called the Bernoulli's equation which describes how airplanes can fly. And once people grabbed onto that truth, we were able to do something that the facts said was not possible, right? So in our scenario, the fact is there's millions of people who have limited access to surgery. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't look at that problem and take it seriously, like that is a fact. But the truth is that this is actually solvable in our lifetime. And I know that sounds crazy. Um, one question is, is the world improving or is it getting worse? And I think sometimes we have the tendency to think, oh my gosh, the world's getting worse. Because as a generation, we have more access to the internet, Facebook, you know, TV, everything, and we're constantly bombarded with all of these terrible things that are going on in the world. But when you look at a lot of markers of how the world is doing, things are actually getting better all the time. So if you look at the number of people living in poverty, it's just going down. If you look at maternal mortality, it's going down. If you look at child mortality, it's going down in almost every country. If you look at life expectancy, it's going up. And I think if we look at the incredible strides that we've made in infectious disease in global health, um, those are things that we don't even yet have vaccines for and we don't have cures for. And look at like all that we've done. Surgery is something where a lot of these diseases, we know exactly what to do with them. We know how to treat them. We can cure them. So that's why I say I think this problem is solvable in our lifetime. Just going back to this little um, description of flight. So if you think about it, for thousands of years, 
Humans did not fly. That's just a fact of life. Everything sticks to the ground. It was not something we did. Earth did that. We did not fly. And then in 1903, the Wright brothers said, yes, we did. We fly. Only about 60 years later, we put a man on the moon. Just think about that. Within one person's lifetime, we went from never having flown to escaping our planet and going to the moon. I think that's incredible. Um, this is from a speech that President Kennedy gave in 1962. Hmm. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. <clears throat> when I think about all the parents that are in Sub-Saharan Africa, they all had cell phones. And sometimes I just ask myself, how did we end up in a world where everybody has access to a cell phone? but not everybody has access to surgery for their kid. Like, how did that happen? And so I think the phrase that sticks out in this to me is one we are unwilling to postpone. I think it's only a matter of time before it happens that everybody has access to surgery, but it is up to us to decide how long we are willing to postpone that happening. So lastly, I just want to ask you all what you see in this picture. Um, when I look at this picture, I see the grandmothers and grandfathers of pediatric surgery for the nation. And this time I do want to see the this page. Thank you. <laughs> so we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, so I'm interested in knowing how you picked the specific uh, problems that you wanted to work on, and you know whether there did any kind of you know disease burden uh, research and or kind of talk to the people about what was important to them. I found it very interesting that, that their uh, commitment to doing something about it actually was affected by having participated in publishing a paper. So kind of what happened in between what you came with interest in and, and where you ended up and how that how you kind of align those with the folks on the ground. Yeah, I think the colorectal patients, it's a big interest for the whole team. Um, it's certainly a personal interest of mine because all the things I've seen. Um, but the team there literally is just like flooded with kids who have these anal confirmations. And so um, I think it was a thing that jointly we decided something needs to be done about this. Um, and I think if we can get the colorectal coordinator it would make the lives of the surgeons a lot easier because they're trying to like balance all these things at once. Um, I kind of equate it to, you know, we talked some about having these um, essential surgery providers where basically you train a lay person how to do certain surgical techniques. Um, so I think we could also train lay people to do other jobs in surgery that you don't necessarily need a surgeon um, to do those things. So I haven't done any complicated um, burden analysis. If there's anybody in this room that wants to help me do that, that would be awesome. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's very important to work on projects which are important to local people and not what's important to us. Um, partly because you won't get very far if it's not important to them. Wonderful talk. Thank you for sharing all that experiences. I'm very curious. Um, how do you plan or how do you see um, for a long term? And you, know, you talk about the infectious diseases versus surgery and other non communicable diseases. I think the impact of the lack of system um, is much bigger for something like surgery. Um, because you need infrastructure, you need a you know, skilled individual. Um, you know, it's just somehow, you know, I work mostly in Myanmar and we struggle with these questions every day. 
And the, it's difficult as you know, people with outsiders, you know, when you see that every day. Do you have the opportunity to have that type of discussion, that type of communication with your collaborators, your colleagues in Uganda? And the other question I have is that the fellows and the residents and fellows that you draw trained, um, are they part of the private sector or the public sector? Okay, so let me add to the systems question just first. That's a great question. Um, fortunately, I didn't have time to talk about like everything. But clearly, if you're going to train surgeons, you also have to train anesthesiologists. You're not going to get anywhere if you don't train them. Um, the part that I talked about with gastrospecies, one discussion that's gone on is creating bellwethers for pediatric surgery. And gastrospecies, we think, is a great bellwether. Because the surgery is actually not hard. Like, it's not hard to put all those intestines back in and just close up the hole. That's very easy. What is hard is you kind of need to have a neonatologist. You need to have TPN. You need to be able to put in central lines. So it's really a measure, not just of your surgical skill, but it's a measure of the system that's in place around you. Um, and in the past, I've had some friends who are neonatologists come to Uganda with me and try to help in that. So yeah, I definitely think it's a multidisciplinary it's an infrastructure building which needs to take place. Um, we do have another surgeon now who's out in Inverara, and one of our fellows is out there with him. And I think we're hoping um, that as part of the system, we can develop pediatric surgeries in other locations besides just Mulago, so patients aren't always traveling there. And what was your second question? Well, I'm curious about the people you train. Um, yes. So we. You know, we, whenever we train, there is a risk that that person will not pull you back. Or there is a risk that there is nothing attractive for him or her to go back to. And so I'm just wondering what keeps your trainees in the captain system. Yeah. So that's Are they in the public sector or public sector? Yeah, that's a problem on two levels because um, one problem we're having is that we're training surgeons, and even though there's a huge need for them, there's no job for them. So that's been a challenge. Um, we've kind of finagled various ways of trying to get them jobs, and our surgeon that we have out in Barara, he's actually supported by Bethany Kids, which is a faith-based organization. Um, so that's a problem. Um, and what's the <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely finding jobs for surgeons has been a problem. Most of them right now are working in the government sector. Yeah. But one of our surgeons, two of our surgeons actually, they do private cases on the side to supplement their income and make more money. Um, so yeah. So, um, great talk. Thanks very much. I, I want to follow up with a question about your Fast Connections project. Yes. I remember when we first met. August, I mentioned Best Connections, and you showed some interest, but I could never have imagined that three months later you would have fun with that. So <laughs> congratulations on that. Can you talk about um, how you're going to engage students and from which schools, and what exactly will they do on the project? Yeah, so at this stage of the project, a lot of it is going to be developing an actual prototype. So I think we kind of foresee having a lot of engineering and a lot of medical students. Um, but I think in later parts of the project, um, you know, we're going to have more issues with, you know, legal issues and um, marketing issues. And I think students from those realms will be certainly needed when we get to those parts of the project. So since um, we are very interested in the presentations and introductions, I just want to uh, make a one comment. After the Lancet Commission report on global surgery, more and more people are interested or pay attention to this uh, access to surgical cooperation, particularly the developing countries. But your presentation highlights uh, five or six key points in this Commission report, which really are uh, critically important. But what I found is that the Lancet Commission report uh, missed uh, one of the very important issues. That is, in many parts of the world, particularly the country, in fact, there are over-use or over-provision 
of surgical operation, which had huge implication for quality, okay, or quality and the cost. I'm glad to, uh, to see you mentioned the catastrophic health expansion. For example, in many Latin American countries, in China or Vietnam or some parts of the world, early use of C-section rates is quick. You know, the C-section rate is 70s, 50s, uh, um, uh, cost lots of money, uh, particularly in the uh, uh, limited health resources value. Uh, and also there are some implications for quality care. Okay. And people want to say, oh, we should worry about that. So in Africa, there are a long way to go to overuse or over provision of a surgical operation. I want to say, be careful about that. My experience of working in health system in China, 15 years ago, in western part of China, the C-section rate, for example, was is around 5%. So that ratio used to be set by 15% of C-section rates as the other stick, and now they have a is, uh, is uh, quite curious. So just 15 years later, C-section rates in western part of China, relatively poor areas, now is 30 a 40%. It's huge, you know, increase within a relatively short period because the physicians or uh, the surgeons want to earn more money. So, uh, surgeons in China or Latin America and even that actually sometimes earn much more than what uh, the surgeon here earn. is unbelievable. So, with a lot of limited health resources. So, while we, 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 we are right to emphasize the uh, lack of uh, uh, access of uh, lack of uh, access to uh, necessary essential surgical operations in many parts of the world, but we also should be aware in some parts actually overuse, uh, over provision of surgical operation like overuse of antibiotics. So these kinds of things we also should be aware of. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and I think the other half to that point is that needs are different in different parts of the world. Um, I think. From colleagues I know who have worked in Asia, there's not so much of a workforce issue, but sometimes, um, as you point out, there's quality issues and things like that. So um, I think there are different needs for surgery and different needs in different parts of the world. Uh, thank you for that talk. That was great and really good at one point about modernizing the work that you guys are doing. As you see the emphasis on surgery and just some of the colleagues there. Um, being focused on that, have you seen the perioperative care? Has there been more exposure to that? Have you seen these communications between regional referral centers and the central Criminal hospital? Have you seen any of that communication change? So one thing that we did see change was with the gastrocesis study. Um, the surgeons kind of decided, like, we need to communicate more with the OGYNs. And because of that, we were able to get some patients who had a prenatal diagnosis of gastrocesis. We were getting them to um, deliver the baby at Milago, and we timed it so that a pediatric surgeon would be present. And they literally took the baby from the womb to the operating room, stuffed all the intestines in, put a covering, and then like tried to start feeding the baby like pretty aggressively. And they've seen babies survive now. Um, I don't know that we've seen a lot of communication. We do do outreach camps sometimes when we go to the different um, parts of the country and try to do surgery there. Um, and Martin, who's out in Barara, I know he's gone to like several of the smaller hospitals um, and talked to them about pediatric surgery and things like that. So it's definitely something. There's like if there's so many projects. Anybody who wants to work on these projects, <laughs> I'm just like welcome to help. Any questions? We talked a little bit at the, the very beginning of your talk, kind of about like how this partnership first started, and like the mentor that you had, and and the the doctor who's in Uganda as well. As somebody who's like going into medicine, just starting now, it, it's like interesting this as a topic. Like, how do you see like those kinds of partnerships like continue to form in, in a way that's like sustainable? If this is like a long term fellowship that you all started, like, what is that process of like creating? Or, like, getting involved in that look like for the benefit of particularly in the area they work in. Well, I think you have to value relationships. You have to value relationship more than you value any other goal that you have as part of your team. If you start valuing your goals and your projects more than you value your relationships, your team will go down. 
And so I think that's the most important thing. You have to think through the relationship over a long period of time. So please join me in thanking tomorrow.